Uh, welcome. This is the School Natural Resources Fall Seminar Series, our last of the of this fall. Uh, I'm Mark Burback from the School of Natural Resources, and we can, uh, have saved the best for last. We will see, but I think you'll agree with me that we have. Um, today we have from Colorado State, Mike Manfredo. He is the head of the Department of Human Dimensions and Natural Resources at Colorado State University. He received his BS and MS at, the, at Pennsylvania State University and his PhD at Colorado State University. His area of research and instruction focuses on the interaction of humans and the natural environment. He has published over 80 peer-reviewed articles in a wide variety of natural resource and social science journals. He has published five books. In his most recent book, Wildlife and Society, The Science of Human Dimensions received the Wildlife Society Award for the Best Book of 2008. And this book is in our library, if you're interested. Uh, and please, before I bring him on, uh, I want to announce that we do have an uh, informal visit available to you uh, with Mike uh, in room 901 after our presentation day, if you'd like to sit down and visit with Mike informally. That, again, that's a, right after we're done in room 901. Uh, his seminar, as you can see today, is uh, Societal Thought and w About Wildlife, Shifting Notions of What is Right and Real. Please welcome Mike Manfredo. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Is this working? I actually think it's green. Hello? Can you hear? No. Yes? But can you, is it just me? Hmm? Closer to the mouth. to do is talk about some research that we've done with fish and wildlife agencies on the topic of shifting uh, wildlife value orientations. Um, so let's just get going on that. These are not my advisors. <laughs> some would say they are. But the field of wildlife management's changed dramatically since the real inception of, of the profession of wildlife management with these luminaries that really got things going, not so much Pinchot, but certainly Roosevelt and, and uh, Leopold are, are attributed to that. And the kind of things that were thought of at that time when there's a country that's growing and trying to use its resources <coughs> are not the kind of problems that we have now and the kind of conflict that exists now. This is up in the Russian River, if anyone's been there. Uh, for example, that kind of conflict or just trying to get a management action that everyone agrees on. This is a result of a study that we did in the Denver metro area on the acceptability of various kinds of actions for uh, dealing with mountain lions. It was shortly after a young 19-year-old young was killed by a mountain lion at uh, Idaho Springs. And you can see on that graph of uh, at least four commonly used techniques, uh, really none of them had a majority of people agreeing that that's an acceptable management technique. And that's not uncommon, of course. It's hard to find the kinds of um, actions that everyone agrees to. At the same time, we have a public that wants to get close to wildlife. Why else would an ad like this work? At the same time, you could also look at that and, and say, how uneducated could we be to think that we'd want to get to a grizzly bear that close? And so we're dealing with a, a public that wants to be close to wildlife, but probably isn't, doesn't have the level of education that, that, that makes it a safe encounter at all times. Um, we also have, in some ways, an indifferent public. And that happened to be a person that initially was indifferent, but turned out that he became, his, his attention was, was right there before it was all over. This is uh, actually in, in uh, Brazil. But, but the fact of the matter is we've got many wildlife issues that weren't what the or originators of our management philosophy now had, had thought about. Humanitarian issues, what's right and what's wrong in terms of how we treat wildlife in this case, this has to do with trapping. <clears throat> and, and of course, what, what do we, we've got a, a rapidly declining uh, 
biodiversity. Um, we have concerns about rare, threatened, and endangered species. This happens to be, I'm very proud of, <laughs> uh, a long-eared owl that happened to be in my backyard. <laughs> he was there the whole winter, and I never knew it until the spring came around and had a couple babies. And of course we have a common conflict that wildlife agencies deal with all the time, is conflict amongst different forms of recreation. And of course hunting is the tradition of, of this country when it comes to use of wildlife. And, and agencies are so concerned with the loss of hunters, the rapidly declining, I should say consistently declining uh, proportion of people that are hunters. And at the same time a growing interest in wildlife viewing. So the questions that we wanted to look at in concert with wildlife agencies had to do with whether or not there's a change in public values toward wildlife and is it causing a rise in social conflict and is it fueling this decline in participation in hunting. We did this work, uh, and it's ongoing work. I'm going to tell you principally about one study, but then bring in others that are building upon that. Um, and it was done through the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, uh, 19 states, western states in the, in the WAFWA, and uh, we at CSU worked with them. So when you approach a question like that, it's pretty difficult. I mean, you're going to do cross-sectional research, and your question is, our values changing. So we looked at what kind of theoretical guidance we might get to inform that. <clears throat> and, and if you look over long, long term, uh, what you see is with hunters and gatherers, person to person's relationships were built on egalitarian values, equal sharing. Uh, at the same time, the relationship that we note with people to people is kind of the same that you see with people to wildlife. So in virtually all hunter and gatherer societies, there's this sense of sharing, part of nature, part of wildlife, at the same time a sense of subjugation to nature overall. As we became pastoralists, Everything changed. All of a sudden, when you look in society, you become a hierarchical society, and uh, there'd be mastery over others in terms of being within the society. Someone that works for me tends my herd. At the same, by the same token, there's a sense of mastery that's projected then onto wildlife. And it's remained pretty much that way as culture has evolved and changed over time. So that that there was a critical transition as we went from egalitarian relationships in society and with wildlife to m more of a subjugation to wildlife or over wildlife. But the question now is, and it's a critical one, are we returning to more egalitarian relationships in this post-industrial society? And I'm here to provide evidence that we are but it's in not quite the same form that you'd find in hunter and gatherer societies. I love going to Rome for these magnificent statues that you see and, and it just screams about our domination over natural resources and, and wildlife. <clears throat> Here's a quote that really typifies our domination value orientation over wildlife. It comes obviously right from the Bible and <clears throat> And God said, let man have dominion, forgive the gender impropriety, uh, over all the earth and everything upon the earth. Now, there are anthropologists that say that domination ideology that was so much a part of our colonial exploits internationally are the very th is the very thing that allowed us to be so successful in our rapid expansion in the United States and elsewhere that domination ideology born from a Calvinistic religion said not only is it our duty to go out and have dominion but there's salvation in it as well. It's a critical point. 
It's interesting if you go from that biblical reference and you go to a psychologist doing work globally on values and value ideals within societies. Here you have 76 different countries. This guy, Shalom Schwartz, has done work in every country and he's tried to capture the value ideals within these countries. And he depicts it along three different dimensions. One is embeddedness versus intellectual and affective autonomy. Embeddedness, you feel part of your, consider yourself and a lot of your ideals are about being part of the group. Autonomy is you put value on the individual standing apart. Egalitarianism and your political uh, orientations versus hierarchy. And so in this case, egalitarianism, all voices should be heard and valued. Uh, uh, hier uh, hierarchical, immediately you probably think of China, a very hierarchical, top-down sort of arrangement. Now, when it comes to relationships with nature, it's pretty simple. He just has this dimension that's harmony or domination. And the defining domination, as you can clearly see, or maybe you can't, the United States is right beside that word domination. It's been and written up as the defining value orientation and ideal of the United States. But what is interesting in, in the theory and what we see in contemporary, in the contemporary work is a transition from a domination to an egalitarian value orientation in terms of how we look at nat the natural environment and wildlife in particular. Okay? So why would that be happening? Well, there's a fellow out of political sciences called uh, Ron Engelhardt, and he's advanced this notion of modernization theory. Actually, Marx was the first person to talk about modernization theory, and this is a, a renewed or a different version of it. <clears throat> and what he talks about in this theory is he takes the Maslow hierarchy idea I'm betting you've all, you're all familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. And it says, as an individual, you have to satisfy some of your basic needs before you can go to higher order needs. So you have to solve in your life safety and security, psychological, physiological needs before you go on then to belongingness and love needs, onto esteem, and then ultimately self-actualization. So all Engelhardt said was, Let's apply this to countries, generally. And so he looks at the developed countries of the world. He says, prior to World War II, values for the most part formed around concern for economic well-being and what I'll call utilitarian needs. Okay, we're very focused if you use the Maslow comparison to that bottom rung. Post-World War II, with the opulence that grew from rapid growth and wealth that happened, all of a sudden countries were less focused on those basic needs and started to focus more on belongingness and love needs. So there's this transition where we're less likely to sacrifice for the general good and we're more focused on our own personal needs. That's one thing that happens out of that. But also, the needs that drive us are more about belongingness and being part of something. He also points out the association with this, the association with a loss in faith in government and the, the growth of environmentalism. But the loss in faith of government happens because no longer are you willing to sacrifice for the greater good, which happens at the lower need level. Here's an example of data that comes from, right from Engelhardt. And this helps us understand why this would happen. Remember, it's modernization theory. It talks all about societies changing and becoming more modern, changing lifestyles, greater urbanization, greater wealth, higher levels of education. What he has here on this graph is on the y-axis, we've got materialists, values minus post-materialist values, higher up it goes, 
the more materialist. And that means they're at that lower level of need as a country. And then he links that the gross national product uh, per capita in 1950 for his data set at that time that made sense because his theory is values are set in youth not once you're an adult their va your values are already set you all are set it's your kids that are having values formed now and so you can see this nice you know kind of linear trend he's got a million charts like that that tend to show the same thing so we take that general notion Modernization, now, now he's talking about all values changing, the whole network. We're taking a smaller part of that, and that's just how people think about wildlife and how they value wildlife. And we suggest that value orientations are changing with an increasingly modern lifestyle in which there's an insulation from dependency on resources. I gave this lecture in the Netherlands last week, and someone in the audience said, they had just heard of a study in the Netherlands where half the children that had this survey said that meat comes from supermarkets and it's manufactured there. I don't think we'd find it terribly different in many places in the United States. I don't know about here, but I think that's part of what's happening. There's this barrier between where things come from and what people get. We have social learning versus direct learning. Kids learn about wildlife on Discovery Channel or on cartoons or through stories. It's not face to face. They don't, that mean they just aren't out in close contact with nature or wildlife. Social reinforcement. Well, that's really critical. I mean, we are part, we're, we're social animals. Um, and the fact of the matter is, you know, when you become the outlier, you either adjust or you leave. And so if you're someone that's, say, a hunter in Denver, well, you've got to look harder for friends and a social milieu in which that's hunting discussions and acceptable discussion. Um, you just have to look harder. And uh, the fact of the matter is there's less reinforcement. I mean, having your child go, and that's, when it's, that's where it's happening, you're having your child go to school and want to tell stories about dad's hunt or the hunt with dad, just less socially acceptable. I mean, gosh, the city I was brought up in, 5,000, I mean, the first day of hunting was, everyone was off in rural Pennsylvania, so it's just totally different. There are substantial barriers now to natural experience in an urbanized setting. A big issue is just if you want to hunt, for example, where do you go? Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting at the psychological level. Psychologists, and, and remember I said that we're moving from this one level of uh, need to this level of so need for social affiliation. And what you find at the individual level, there's research that suggests that we do have hi higher need for affiliation. We have more people around us, but less meaningful relationships. And so there's this higher need for affiliation. And at the same time, we look at wildlife as companions. Anthropomorphizing, which has been thought of as the great evil of the Cartesian sciences, is in fact an inherited trait that's universal amongst humans. Everyone anthropomorphizes is what we believe now. And there's a very good reason for that. Why would we want to anthropomorphize? I know I haven't asked you to engage, but I'm going to on this one. Why would anthropomorphizing be something advantageous evolutionarily? Anthropomorphizing, by the way, is projecting human characteristics onto animals, wildlife, inanimate objects. Why would it be? Anyone? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. That's good. You're listening to the beginning. He said an extension of relating to other people. That's, that is, in fact, 
one of the early anthropologists talked about the way we understand nature by the way we understand one another. So we, that's good, but why would that be advantageous? You've got a part of it. That's it. <clears throat> the original theory about it was called man the hunter is that we were great hunters. And so in, if we anthropomorphize, we can understand wildlife better and use it. We'd be better hunters. The contemporary theory, by the way, is that we're man the prey. And I use that term exactly as it was talked about. So <clears throat> we weren't great hunters. We were, the reason we're such a collective species is because we were prey. We were the things animals eat. So when we talk, going back to our problem in our situation, um, here's how we conceptualize two roots to understanding how wildlife should be treated. If you take a value like being humane, which is generally accepted as a value that transcends cultures, it's bent by your value orientation or your cultural ideal. It's bent. So if you have an egalitarian orientation, we would say that turns into what we consider a mutualist orientation, and this will be the last so social psych kind of slide. But you look at wildlife as a companion with this egalitarian orient orientation, and you might come out with a belief that says wildlife should never be harmed. Okay? You could have that very same value, being humane, but with a domination value orientation, uh, uh, cultural ideal, you'd have a mastery orientation, and your belief might be more like, it's okay to take wildlife as long as you don't inflict unusual pain and suffering but you can have the same value but hold different beliefs based on how that value gets bent, if you will, or how you're socialized to come, different, to come to different beliefs. So let me talk about those two value orientations. And first let me say that our view, a lot of the work I've done I should have acknowledged at the beginning is with Tara, Dr. Tara Teal. And uh, she has been my co-investigator on this. Wildlife value orientations have really, we've conceptualized it having two parts. An ideal world in terms of how you relate to wildlife or how we live with wildlife. And then what are ethical treatments? How, what, what's right for what we do with wildlife? And we've captured this into two basic dimensions, as I put in that earlier slide. Mutualism in which the ideal world, and I've got some statements here that depict it, one might say if they had this as their value orientation, that wildlife and humans could live side by side without fear, <clears throat> or all living things are part of one big family. There may be some expectation or feeling of an emotional bond and companionship with wildlife in this ideal world, and that there'd be no animal suffering. Now, you might look at that and think, oh, that's me, or you might look at it and say, that's crazy. And I'm not trying to say it's right or wrong, I'm saying there are people that believe this. And this depicts accurately how they feel. Their principles of how to treat wildlife would be captured in statements like, animals should have rights like humans, we should take care of wildlife, or we should prevent cruelty to animals. Again, their ideology is bent by this egalitarianism view. At the bottom of that slide, there's a statement that came from one of our surveys that depicts that all of us need to protect all creatures on Mother Earth. We must speak for the ones who can't. This is in opposition, if you will, or in contrast to what we've referred to as a utilitarian value orientation. And in that orientation, there's this ideal world. 
in which wildlife exists for human use and enjoyment, that there would be an abundance of wildlife out there for us to use however we want. The principles that we live by, the ethical treatment principles, would be that we just want to manage wildlife so that the humans benefit and that the needs of humans take priority over wildlife. Again, the ideology is domination or mastery. Here's a statement. Animals and plants are pieces of energy out there to provide humans with food and inspiration. And you can see the contrast between these two kinds of ideologies. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about how we... Oh, I'm going to go right to the results. I'm not going to talk very much about how we measured. In case you're interested, we used surveys. It was a male survey. We had a pilot phase. Uh, with a lot of pre-testing, we ultimately did 19 western states, uh, 12,000 surveys, 7,600 telephone follow-ups, and we did end up weighting data. Uh, I, we could talk about methods, but I find that far less compelling than, than uh, some of the findings that we have. As I show you these findings, first let me just say <coughs> we had these two dimensions that we measured utilitarian and mutualism. And when I talk about utilitarians, they would be people that scored on the uh, upper part of the utilitarian scale that we talked about and the, on the low side of mutualism. And then mutualists would be the reverse of that, mm -hmm. just so you know. We gave labels to these other folks. We called these folks pluralists. They're high on, high on both. And there were actually a fair number of people that fell into that category. And then these we just called distance. That gives you an idea. When I talk about them, this is how they fall out in our measurement scale. So let's just go to some of these findings. <coughs> so there's the Western United States. And the darker the color, the more the utilitarians. This is just the a map of utilitarians. And you can see that um, the northern Intermountain West is heavily mutualist or uh, utilitarian. Alaska was the highest at 50%, Hawaii the lowest. You can see on the outer rim there's a much lower proportion of utilitarians within society. Stop me if you have a question, okay? Here's the percent classified as mutualists, which you'll find to be pretty much the reverse of utilitarians. <coughs> there are about 23% that would be classified in this state as mutualists, about a quarter, one in four. And the highest would be in Hawaii, about 40%. Uh, again, you see this reverse pattern. Something's going on in the Intermountain West relative to the, the coastal states. <coughs> Those are the distance. So uh, the question now that we started this with, <laughs> are wildlife value orientations changing in the Western United States? <coughs> and you remember what I said was, if we're going to take that concept that Engelhart talks about, that modernization is the driver of change. Okay? That's what's causing this shift. And it, and it happens because it changes the context of life. The place we live becomes different, and it affects our values. But the indicators of modernization would be income, education, and urbanization. And I have those data, and I've plotted it by state. I think anyone that's been involved in social survey work will say it's pretty uncommon for you to have this kind of data where you can plot states and individuals both. And so you've probably not seen social science data very often that depicts at a cultural level. Now I'm not doing it. And, uh, uh, we have uh, hierarchical linear modeling results that actually do both simultaneously individual in cultural ana analysis. <clears throat> I'm just giving you the, uh, the easy to see part. 
and easy to understand because this shows a real nice linear trend. Y-axis says percent of mutualists in the state. This says a percent above the modal res uh, response on income. You can see this nice linear trend, a descriptive R of 0.75. That's a pretty good relationship in the social sciences. We get excited when it's 0.25. <clears throat> Here's percent utilitarian by education, okay? But I've changed this around a little because this says percent utilitarian going from 20 to 60. But this, as it goes up, is less education. It's percent high school education or less. So I'm going to pick out Nebraska in here. Green dot up there. So it's less than the average here in education and higher at the same time in uh, percent utilitarian. But you see this nice linear trend, again, a 0.75 descriptive R. <coughs> and lastly, urbanization. What you see here, same thing. We have percent residing in a city or a large city, percent mutualist, simple. The, the more urbanized, the more mutualist you have in a state. And Nebraska is right kind of there in the middle, the green dot again. So what we're starting to do is see that these indicators of a changing lifestyle, it's not like urbanization causes a shift in values. It's like urbanization changes life and the changed life and the people around you change your values. And you don't move someplace and have that happen. You move someplace and it's your kids that it happens to. Very much a gradual process. You can't change values. I mentioned earlier that environmentalism uh, grows as the percent of mutualists grow. And this is the reverse of that. What it shows is the percent environmentalist in a state it goes from 30 to 70. And this is the percent utilitarian in a state. And you can see, again, Nebraska is down on the lower side of this. That is the percent of utilitarians in a state increases the percent of people that are environmentalists decreases. And I also said something about the loss of faith in government. what this on this y-axis says percent trusting government most of the time or almost always and then this is percent mutualists across the x-axis and there's this inverse relationship and what you see the more mutualists their needs are being met less the more mutualists uh, uh, the less trust in state government so there's this interesting transition that you can see it. I mean, it's apparent. Values are shifting. It's modernization. It's leading to this mistrust in agencies, fish and wildlife agencies. Now, wouldn't you say conflict has to come from that? Conflict does come from it and also comes from it a loss of hunters. So, this is quite interesting. This is this y-axis shows the percent of past hunters who actually are active, who hunted in the last 12 months. Okay? And this is the percent utilitarian in a state. Okay? And you get this beautiful linear trend. Again, activism in hunting. So there were a bunch of people that hunted. They get into these states where it's more mixed and there's growing modernization. They don't hunt anymore. And it's all the things I said. You know, there's no resource availability. There's no social support. So you, you start to see this trend of things that's happening. And I ask myself, I know the agencies right now are putting a lot of money in trying to recruit people to come be hunters again. And when you've got these kind of processes going on and you're changing the fundamental fundamental values of people, you're, you know, you're using a thimble to bail out the boat. Because this, this change is happening. 
So is this a foundation for conflict? Well, let's take some of these findings and look at some differences on some key issues and, and participation variables. This is uh, uh, fishing, hunting, and viewing, the traditional activities, wildlife associated. Um, this shows that about 22% of utilitarians fish and uh, uh, somewhere under 10% of mutualists. And, and when it comes to hunting, mutualists uh, and these distance people don't, don't, don't hunt at all. It's pluralists and utilitarians. But mutualists are, are really participating in viewing. It's over 30%, 33%. Gives you some sense that behavior follows value orientations. And when you look at issues, the kind of issues that wildlife managers are dealing with quite frequently, uh, and this, this is just from one state. And the question is about percent of Nevada residents finding a, a, these kinds of actions acceptab acceptable in the condition where bears are, are getting into the trash, basically. And there are, there are three different actions. Do nothing, provide more recreational opportunities to hunt bears, or have controlled hunts. And boy, you can just see there are places where the groups come together and there are places where they really separate. So one of the things we find across a lot of management actions is the value orientations just put people in the pile. And they, they differ incredibly in how they support management. So it's not some, you know, just a theoretical proposition or observation. It has something to do that comes right back to the manager's lap. Um, the do nothing is not acceptable and it's at a lower level, but when you talk about recreational hunting, boy, you see people just split in opposite poles, and it comes back together a little bit on controlled hunts. But that's the kind of thing we see. Now, what we, this, these are recent results that we just, well, we just submitted the report to Washington. And what we've been exploring is the use of this understanding of different value orientations that people have at very refined geographic level. So for Washington, what we have is we have their value orientations by county. And boy, this really is helpful to the agency. Um, at least that's our initial feedback. This map shows utilitarians mutuals versus mutualists as a ratio. So where it's really brown, the darkest brown, there are five utilitarians to, for example, one mutualist. So it's, it's a place that's predominantly focused on utilitarianism, the brown. The green is a place where there's almost an even split. So you can see quite a bit of contrast in the state. When you're on the west side, east side, you're going to be dealing with a different audience than when you're on the west side. And just to give you an, a sense of the kind of difference it can make. And remember that map. Take a look and remember it. Let's just take wolves and, and, and the issue of uh, moving wolves to help establish new populations, which is an issue for Washington. Statewide, what you find is that 74% accept it. This is familiar to me because I did work in Colorado in the mid-90s, and 79% wanted wolf reintroduction there. Now let's take a look at that state breakdown on that again. And what a difference it makes. The darkest brown in the Seattle-Tacoma area, somewhere around 72 to 80 percent say, yeah, let's reintroduce new populations of wolves. But when you look up in those eastern counties, northern and eastern counties, you get less than like one in five saying that it's acceptable. And so you get some sense of regional politics out of this or regional differences. And you can't talk the talk in the valley that you can, that you need to talk in the northeastern part of the state. And, and again, remember, the value orientations up in that area were very utilitarian in their orientation. And you could just go down through just kind of like that with value orientation, predict responses. 
I like this one. This one's kind of interesting. Again, remember, mutualists in the valley here. Uh, up in that area, there's more utilitarian. This, uh, one of the things we're able to do is look at issues like black bear conflict. The green shows habitat for black bear. And one of the big issues is, you know, conflict. Um, so the, the, the group, in terms of whether they want uh, black bears to be removed or not, when, when they're in a nuisance situation, you can see down in this area very, very high percentages, 70, 64 to 70 percent would like to see a, a nuisance bear killed and removed. When you get over into the valley over there, it's much smaller percentages, uh, 40, under, under half. And again, remember, this is mutualist. And they're more utilitarian over there. Isn't that interesting? That's where the black bear incidents have been reported. So I have two hypotheses here. Um, these folks are living and are interested in learning more on living with wildlife or these people that want to see in this corner, that want to see bears killed, maybe just killed them all. I'm, I'm not sure. But the fact of the matter is, the people with a mu more mutualist orientation are far more accepting, and that's where the encounters are happening. So it becomes a very interesting predictive tool. And that finding is, another, is, is similar to a finding that we have in South Dakota, which is where we're doing another pilot on you know, geographic specific information. And then this is in the Black Hills region. And, and really what this shows is an overlay of mountain lion habitat where we have uh, lots of problems with mountain lion. And it's uh, in these valleys that go stretch up into the Black Hills National Forest. And then what we have color-coded is what's the predominant response that the public would like to see with mountain lion encounters. Green is educate and relocate, and red is destroy the lion up where there aren't any. So it's a kind of an interesting juxtaposition that you, that you see. And what you'd also see on there is that that location is also... Um, where there are more mutualists as well. So, okay, what I've tried to talk about is that we've had this transition on how we relate to wildlife. What we think is right in what we do with wildlife as well as what we perceive to be real, our relationships with wildlife. It not only is a, an important phenomenon socially, but, but it's had an important impact on how wildlife managers are able to deal with conflict and manage wildlife. Um, we have this increasingly modern life that's affecting values toward wildlife. We call it modernization. We have this continued slow growth of mutualism. My own prediction is we'll ebb and flow and continue to work in that direction unless there's some cataclysmic change in, in how developed countries mature. I think you see it now, and it'll just expand. And I hear a lot from wildlife manager friends that I have that they were brought up to do population level management. And the equation's fairly simple. The way we control things is by hunts, increasing hunting allocation. Very, that's the tried and true method. But increasingly, they're being driven to do individual level animal measurement. And I was struck when I was at a Western Association meeting when they were talking about the scene, if you remember a couple years ago, young 14-year-old was camping in Utah and was drug out of his tent by a black bear and killed. And he was talking about the scene and they taped it off with the tape and they put out an all-points bulletin on the roads. And it just seemed like we're kind of going to this egalitarianism 
in how we treat the offending wildlife, much like we would with an offending human. And so all of a sudden we're starting to talk about the offenders and, and they have violated some norm unknown to them, some law unknown to them. But, but wildlife management agencies are increasingly having to deal with individual animals and population management is, we're still going to have to have it, but increasingly there will be this individual animal management. Um, increasingly also, we're gravitating away from hierarchical management to more consensus building. Now, this isn't just with wildlife management, it's in virtually all areas of government and it's part of what this modernization theory projects that increasingly we go to having to have everybody's voice heard on issues and it's increasingly difficult to get consensus. I'm betting Obama would agree with that one. So if anyone hasn't had enough and they would like more about the work that we've done at least up to the point where I was doing the geographic stuff. We've got a couple different article, articles that, are, that I'd direct you to. One's in conservation biology and the other's in social science quarterly. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have about any of this work or any concepts that I've introduced. Can I just go ahead, Mark? And I think that's directed to mutualists. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a subjective guess. That was outside of uh, Yellowstone. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I think, I think people, people desperately want to be close to wildlife. How else could you explain that being a captivating idea? I mean, anybody that knows anything about grizzly bears knows that'd be about the last place you'd want to be but we just have such a strong desire to be close to wildlife that that's an appealing idea. Uh, and I have to say, I, we're working with a person that's in China doing panda bear, I'm going to confess, panda bear research. And she said, if you come over, you can hold a panda. I was like, okay, I'm not going to lie, that's cool, I'd like to do that. <laughs> and I am not a mutualist, actually. I used to live in Boulder, Colorado, and it was very true what you say about people being really excited about having the managed deer herds in town and you know rumors of, of uh, mountain lions and bears and things being around. But where I did see a change was when a lion or a bear would come into town and usually they were either sick or desperate or young. They didn't understand to stay away from people and they would hurt usually it was a pet and then people would get really upset and they'd overreact and you know go straight from zero to 60 and talk about you know shooting them down and and it was the offender like you say but I wonder how that fits in because I think maybe sometimes the the person who's the mutualist hasn't necessarily had something threatening happen to them and then when it does they change their tune you know that's I, I actually have <laughs> data for the front range that shows on, on progressively more severe situations, just sighted, uh, kills a pet, injures a human, kills a human. And of course what you find is that people gradually as a group become more accepting of killing a lion. In this case it was a lion. But what I found remarkable was that 33% of people, after a lion had killed a person, said the lion was doing the right thing. I mean, think about that. So, you know, that the, the lion should not be killed. Invariably, what you find, though, is uh, the, the most frequently, the, the action that everyone always wants is to relocate the lion, no matter what. It's always the most popular thing, which, of course, isn't impractical. But yeah, I mean, they do, people move on that, the severity of, of what happens. There's no doubt about it. But still, there's this hardcore 
our group. It just gone a dimension. You talked about that uh, state agencies or federal agencies trying to recruit more hunters was like bar bailing the water out of a boat with a thimble. <laughs> Do you have recommendations for that? Yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> Embrace wildlife viewers. That's what that's what we need to do. I don't think hunting will ever go away. It's too much of uh, the cultural tradition in the United States. But I also think wildlife agencies have a responsibility to s to, to serve the public and and in, and make them wildlife lovers. I mean, if there was one goal that I think. All, most wildlife agencies would would actually say in theory they'd like to do it make people appreciate wildlife <coughs> some of them would say make them appreciate hunting too but but I think that's the mandate and so that means get getting them however we can and by the way we're doing a research project is is the wildlife viewing tour here in this city Alicia yeah yeah so there's a great example you got one right here in town it's a model of the kind of thing that's terrific need more of those so so as a follow-up to that uh, funding I think is the primary mechanism that is keeping state agencies from jumping on that bandwagon as quickly so how do you deal with the funding issue you know there are a lot of ways to get funding if it's important <coughs> and and uh, and I know a lot of places well I know at least Missouri had a, 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 a tax passed. A Arkansas? Was there a, a, Alicia's going like that. She's my fact checker. Was there another state? Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think the public would support it. Uh, and, and if they, you know, if there's, whenever there's been ballot initiatives when it comes to wildlife, I think they've always come through on their support for it. I, I, know, I know there needs to be funding to support that kind of activity. And I think just like we get funds for education or any of the other things that come through government, there are ways to do it. And saying that, you know, just because hunters fund it now, and I, I don't think that's what you're saying, but I, I've heard the argument, just because hunters fund it now doesn't mean they own it. It's a public good. Now the hunters are ready to run me out of the room. <laughs> I'm a hunter. I'll show you pictures of the elk I got this year. I just believe this is something for everybody. There's something about wildlife for everybody. I, I was wondering a little bit more. I was just wondering about the... Um, when you did your survey regarding the egalitarians, did you find anything that showed that people like to think of themselves as egalitarian as opposed to, because I, I used to be a wildlife control operator, and what I was always intrigued at how a person's emotions would change, sometimes even within my presence, that uh, as long as it wasn't in their backyard, they were egalitarians, but as soon as the raccoon was staring at them from their kitchen table, they became a dominionist very, very quickly. So I'm intrigued as how much of this is just people like to feel good about themselves as opposed to any, any conscious reflection to change their own behavior. Uh, you know, that's a really good question. And what you're talking about is introducing kind of family, other people into this equation. It's just not me and this wildlife. It's uh, competing values, safety for my family. And in, and actually, a smart pollster <laughs> will take an issue, a ballot initiative issue, and confuse it by introducing a competing value. That's just what they do. They'll introduce an argument. So it creates that conflict and gives self-doubt. <clears throat> um, so sometimes that, that will happen. There's, n there's no doubt about it, and you've probably seen it. But I think people, people's values about this are real, and they'll follow through in, in cases where there isn't that kind of competition. And you brought up something really important, though. I think many times people take on a value orientation, 
and it becomes very much part of their identity, very much of who they are, what they wear. I mean, anybody that hangs out with hunters <laughs> knows that what they wear screams, I'm a hunter, and in different forms of hunting. I mean, so, so yeah, our value orientation is very much direct uh, who we want to project ourselves as. That which isn't exactly what you meant, but it's an important point. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and please uh, for give a hand to uh, Mike. Thank you for being here.